What's up world? I'm Tristan Wade from My Poker Coaching and today I'm going to give you 10 tips for playing post flop after raising before the flop. So what do I mean? If you're the pre-flop aggressor and you've raised before the flop, I'm going to give you some easy tips on how to play after the flop. All right, first things first, playing post flop is the most important aspect of no limit hold'em. Sure, it matters what hand you start with, but it matters how you play those hands after the flop. There's only one street pre-flop. There's three streets post-flop. You have the flop, turn, and river. So you really need to understand the mechanics behind what goes into all of that, right? There's a lot to consider over three streets. This is exactly what I was getting into. So start with the flop and work there. Think about the range your, per, your opponent starts with pre-flop and then start extrapolating that after the flop. So let's say you have a really dry flop and you know that they wouldn't con um, continue with really weak hands. So now you can start eliminating some of the range that they started with when you get to the turn and then ultimately the river. So it's really important to understand how someone's range starts on the flop and what happens to it as the hand moves forward. Simplify your strategies when possible. Um, what I mean by this, and these aren't these aren't necessarily the tips yet. These are the pre-tips to try to get you into the mode of uh, playing post-flop. But what I mean by simplify your strategies is understand the nature of board texture. Understand having a small bet or maybe a big bet. Um, just try anything that makes it easier on you to play the game where you don't overthink or you don't stumble because you're trying to do too much. So it's really important just to have some simple kind of strategies to incorporate for uh, your everyday player. And then always consider ranges and how they change as the hand moves forward. Like I said, it starts with a pre-flop um, understanding of someone's range, but we really move on from that when we get to the flop and then to the turn and then to the river, right? Things are going to change. If you bet the flop, you expect your opponent to fold some hands and call with some hands and maybe raise some other hands. So it's really important to understand how to splice that all up and how to think in terms of strategy. Poker is a strategy game. Anyone who thinks it's just about looking at your opponent and figuring out what they have, maybe that's the case occasionally, but it's usually not, right? If you're playing someone who's balanced, they're gonna have bluffs and they're gonna have value hands and then they're gonna wanna do something with the hands in the middle. So it's really important to think about range and think about how someone's gonna play a strategy game. And that's what I'm here to help you with, right? All right, let's move on to the 10 tips. Number one, continuation bet more on dry boards. Now this one's a pretty easy one. This is kind of poker 101. If you are the first person to enter the pot and someone calls you and you get a really dry board, let's say ace high, no, no flush draw, no straight draw. I'll give an example, ace eight deuce. Right, the only straight draws are three five, four five, three four, that kind of stuff. You don't expect people to really play those cards that much unless they're in the big blind and those hands might be have to be suited. So anyway, you have the advantage here because you have more pocket aces. You have more ace king and ace queen. Um, so it's just kind of natural in the strategy of the game to continuation bet on more dry boards that favor the initial raiser. So that's your first tip. Second tip, check stronger hands on connected boards. And what this means is sometimes if a board's really connected, you want to have some strong hands in your checking range because you don't really connect with the board. So for example, let's say the flop comes five, six, seven, and you have pocket aces. Okay, it's great, we got pocket aces. We got the best hand you could start with, but it's not really that great of a hand on five, six, seven because someone could have flopped a set Someone could have made two pair. Someone could have flopped a straight. And even if they just have a hand like ace eight, which you dominate, they actually have eight outs against you. They could hit a four or a nine. And on the flop, that would be about 32% to beat your pocket aces. So sometimes you want to check stronger hands on connected boards because of the texture of the board. And that's a real key concept when it comes to this game. And the reason we do that is also balance right? Instead of just always betting your strong hands, you can have some really strong holdings that move forward and then maybe someone thinks you're weak and now you get to trap them. All right, number three, 
Bet smaller on dry boards and bigger on connected ones. Now, I maybe should have changed this, the wordage I used here because I used connected boards above and now I'm using bet smaller on dry boards and bet bigger on connected ones. And there's a little context that needs to be used here. Um, if you are going to bet smaller on dry boards, it's typically safer because the texture of the board isn't going to change that much. And then on uh, connected boards, you already have like a kind of wet texture, we like to call it. So for example, if I'm going to bet on a Jack 10 4 with two spade board, I'm probably going to want to have some bigger bets because the hands that I'm betting are going to either be value or bluffs but I'm already trying to tell a story and uh, create my range in that capacity. And a small bet isn't really gonna accomplish much on connected boards because the same hands that might fold to a small bet or call a small bet, or let me think about this the other way, the same hands that might call a big bet are definitely gonna call a small bet. So sometimes it's better to have bigger betting on connected boards if you do plan to bet. And that's kind of the lesson behind that. I could get more into that, but it's a really complex thing. I'm trying to keep it simple. All right, number four, be more aggressive IP. And that's not intellectual property. That is in position. Then OOP, which is out of position. So be more aggressive in position than out of position. And this makes a lot of sense because you get the information first and then you get to make a decision. So you can apply a lot of pressure to someone who's out of position with all kinds of aggression, whether that's betting, betting large, betting often, or betting frequently, like uh, bet, bet, bet. Um, that's betting flop, betting turn, and betting river. All right, number five, make sure you have a check raising range. This is so important. I see so many amateur players that don't play their hands that should check raise for value fast enough, let's say. So it's really good in a strategy game to have balance amongst your strategy. Obviously, we know when to fold. We know when to call. Sometimes you need to know when to raise. So it's really important to have the balance act within um, that structure. And that comes with like having really good hands to check raise with. And sometimes it has um, really bad hands that want to check raise with too. And it's really important to understand that. Another really in-depth con uh, concept that I could talk about forever, but I'm trying to make it easy on you. Okay, number six, do not overplay your hand versus multiple opponents. This is a crucial, crucial thing when it comes to no limit hold'em. When you are in the pot against one player, easy. You can think about what the hands they have, no problem. But when you have two or three opponents, there are now way more hands to consider and someone is going to have something. So if you have the third nuts or a really strong hand, let's say, but in the grand scheme of things, there's a straight and a flush out there and you have like a set. Well, you need to be cautious because if you have three or four people in the pot, chances are, especially if they're calling bets and they're continuing, that they have something. So you have to really be aware of that when you have multiple opponents. Number seven, group your hands to easily remember how to play them. Uh, this is something that's really helpful once you get down um, if you want to think about poker theory and you start working with a solver and understanding how range gets split into strategy, this is really cool to understand how to group your hands and how to play them. But what I would group hands in this fashion is like top of your range, which is usually going to be the hand you want to value bet, the middle of your range, which maybe is our hands that could win at the river. Uh, they likely might win at the river, but they're not strong enough to bet the whole way. And then bottom of your range, which are hands that definitely aren't going to win. Sometimes you might want to give up with them, but sometimes they do become good bluffs. So it's really good to like, kind of group those hands together and understand how they operate within your range and then how you should play those hands. Number eight, understand who has a range advantage. You might say, Tristan, what's the range advantage? Well, the range advantage means who has the stronger range, who has the more equity when it comes to a flop. So I'm the pre-flop raiser, let's say. I raise under the gun, which is an early position, and the big blind calls me. Well, my range is gonna be about the top 15 to 20% of hands. So I have you know, middling pairs, ace-x suited, good king-x suited, good suited broadways. 
my opponent might defend the big blind with 60 or 70% of hands. So they have a really wide range of 70% of hands and I have a really condensed range to 15 to 20%. So now if a flop came five, six, seven, well, that's probably gonna favor them because they're gonna have five, six offsuit, six, seven offsuit, eight, nine offsuit, uh, you know, that kind of stuff that's really not gonna connect with me. But if the flop comes king, seven, four, well, that's gonna favor me because I have the ace king, which they don't have. I have the aces and the pocket kings and even the queens and the jacks, which they probably don't have. So that's how you understand what a range advantage is. It's starting with the hand you start with preflop and how do they align with the flop and then how wide that range is and what have you. And it really is just an understanding of poker equities and understanding of all the hands we play and how it looks on the board that comes who has the overall advantage when you calculate all those hands versus all those other hands. All right, number nine, know what hands to barrel on later streets. This is really cool because it's part of how you should bluff, right? In this game, you need to know how to value bet. That's easy. If you make the nuts, which is the best possible hand or something close to it, it's easy to know, okay, yeah, I'm supposed to bet, of course. But how do you know when to bluff? Well, that's really crucial. Sometimes you need to have good blockers. Sometimes you need to have a board run out that's in your favor that gives you the equity advantage or, you know, connects with you more. And then sometimes it's just about knowing what your opponent has, knowing how many weak hands your opponent has and what you might be able to do to, to get them to fold uh, given the board texture, what's happened so far, the positions, the range, and all that. And one of the most important things coming in at number 10 is be willing to give up some of the time. That's hard for some people. Sometimes hard for me. Um, but it's, 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 it's just a reality of this game. You have to know when to give up. You have to know when you're not going to be able to bluff someone, when you don't have the best hand, when they aren't going to fold. Sometimes you might even feel it in your bones. It's happened to me plenty of times. I've felt it in my bones. I've looked at this person. I said, this person's just not going to fold. And I still throw the chips out. And then they snap call me and I'm disgusted. So don't do that. Make sure you are willing to give up some of the time. And if you do study poker, if you understand theory, then that will help you as well because giving up is also winning because you're not losing more chips sometimes. All right, so to wrap up the 10 tips we got here, understand range advantage and flop texture. They go hand in hand and it's crucial for you to dev uh, devise your strategy by understanding that. Number two, play a mixed strategy. Know when to check, know when to bet, know when to have big bets, know when you should alter those strategies depending on who your opponents are, what their positions are, what have you. But playing a mixed strategy of being able to do multiple things like check or bet is really important, it's really key in this game. Uh, be aggressive, but also be aware of how many opponents are in the pot and who is in position. Like I said, we've been preaching being aggressive, but it's really crucial to be selectively aggressive. And that's kind of what I was trying to say in the point there. Think through hands and thoroughly if a decision isn't clear. This is a really complex game. Sometimes you need to think. Sometimes you need to take that moment to really understand who is who, what's what, what their hand looks like, and what you should do, right? It's not just about trying to think about what they have, but it's also trying to understand what you have and where you are in the hand and uh, yeah, sometimes it warrants some real thought behind that. And I had to throw a little tip in here. Shout out to my dad, who was a teacher for almost 50 years. And something that I love about life in general is just never stop learning, right? We're human. We're stupid. What do we know, right? I know nothing, but I'm trying. So never stop learning. I think that's one of the most crucial things about life and especially poker. I've been playing poker for over 20 years and I'm still trying to get better. I'm still learning. The game will never be solved. I'll never be perfect. And that's why I'm here sharing these tips with you because I love the game and I love helping people. So make sure you like, subscribe, comment, and let us know at My Poker Coaching what you liked about this video, what you wanna see from us in the future. And don't forget, I'm Tristan Wade. I'm your coach, check me out. Thank you for joining. Hope you enjoyed the video and I'll see you guys next time.